Hey everybody, I am here with Justin Lawrence, the funky, wicked dude for the Colorado Rockies. What is up, Justin? How's it going, Rob? Pleasure to be here. Is that a good enough intro? Because you are kind of funky and nasty. Like, uh, oh, Yeah, I love it. That's right there. So help me understand, like some of your pre-pitch stuff, that was like the first thing that jumped out at me. Like you look like this, like a Spider-Man figure or something like that, just ready to pounce on somebody. Like, is that a yeah. conscious thing? Are you trying to intimidate people or is that just, you know, what, what are you thinking? Honestly, that was it's something that, that came with my debut. I honestly didn't realize it until afterwards. And I was like, okay, the adrenaline was really taken over. Cause I was like, I've, I've really never done that before. But then going back and watching my debut and I was like, okay, that's, it could work, you know, kind of go with it. And, you know, it kind of, kind of went on for the rest of the year. Um, yeah, definitely just something that came along with the adrenaline. Cause it kind of gives off that, like, I love my psycho relievers. Like I think all relievers, closer types, especially, but all relievers should be a little bit, there's a little psycho because you never know when you're going to be in a game, you're always put in tough situations. And I think it helps to be like a little crazy. And that gives me that vibe, which is awesome. Hopefully it gives hitters that vibe too. Yeah. You know, I think it's, you know, being a sidearm guy, you kind of get that mental edge of uncomfortableness to a hitter. So having a little extra crazy on top of it might, uh, might spice it up a little bit. So let's go into that a little bit because you are a sidearm guy and not a, you're funky, but you also throw heat from that arm slot. Have you always thrown hard in general, or is this something that has developed over time? And then we'll get into like how you develop that, that unique arm slot. It's uh, definitely something that developed over time. Um, my freshman year, I was just throwing very stock righty over the top at uh, the college I went to my freshman year. And then um, about halfway through the season, dropped the slot down, wasn't getting a bunch of playing time. So like me, just like wanting to get out on the field, I was like, I got to try something. So I kind of start messing around with that sidearm slot. I mean, at the time it was maybe 84, 87, you know, I was at a small D1. So it got me more playing time for the rest of the year, got outs. Um, so that's kind of where the, the sidearm started. So how did the velo increase? Was it you getting bigger? Was it like weight room stuff? Was it anything mechanically that you changed? Um, I definitely think it was uh, strength, weight room stuff. Uh, I transferred out and went to Daytona State, a small junior college. And um, the fall program we had there was like kind of the first time I really noticed my body putting on good weight and good strength. Um, we would do these crazy pool workouts at five in the morning on Mondays, all this stuff. And you can just like week by week, we all noticed like we were getting stronger. And then once, you know, the baseball stuff started in the fall, I don't know, man, my first, my first bullpen when I went to Daytona was I think 85, 87. And then by the time we had our first inner squad, I remember touching 91, me and my buddy both hit 91. And then from there on out, we're like, it's got to be the weight room. So we like just kind of kept pushing each other and we just kind of kept velo chasing and uh, that velo kept increasing. It was like the next inner squad, I touched 92, you know, the next week, 93, the next week, 94. And up until I got to, I touched 96 our last weekend before the fall ended. What kind of, what kind of workouts did that include? Was it mostly lower half, upper half com combination? It was definitely a combination of both. We'd have lower body days, upper body days. Um, like the big ones for me was like, I know, like when I noticed my legs getting stronger, my back getting stronger, those were kind of the two big muscle groups that I was like, the stronger those got, I felt like I was throwing harder, you know, like when I first got into Daytona in the fall, I mean, I could barely do a single pull up without any assistance or anything like that. And by the end of the fall, you know, I was able to rep out eight, nine, 10 pull ups at a time. That, so that, there was just correlation there. Yeah. And I think, so a lot of kids, I mean, I'm sure kids are watching, but it's one of those things that I tell people like the biggest jump you get isn't a mechanical cue. It's generally strength and conditioning stuff. Like if you get bigger and stronger, and a little bit quicker too. You're, you're usually velo will increase and you can fine tune things over time, but it seems like that was that way with you too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's whether it was, you know, being a late bloomer or whatever it may be, you know, a mixture of, of gaining that strength in the weight room. And a lot of people say I'm hypermobile growing up. They always called me a, call me a baby giraffe. You see me walk like my legs, like it's just, it looks like I didn't know how to walk. I stretched out really quickly in my junior year. So I was just this like 
people either call me baby giraffe, Gumby, like just anything that really, it wasn't the, weren't the greatest nicknames. Um, but between that, I guess, hypermobileness and then adding that strength, it was uh, kind of added to that velo. So were you a travel ball guy too growing up and, and, and like, or were you, sm- and we were on the smaller end growing up, um, like just you know, as younger ages before like high school. I wouldn't say I wasn't on the smaller end. I was definitely always taller, but uh, definitely just kind of that tall, skinny kid growing up. Didn't have, you know, didn't have a ton of pop. Couldn't run very fast because I, you know, I wore size 11s when I was 11. Like just that awkward, awkward tall kid. I, I think there's something to be said about late bloomers because like you have to keep up with other folks. Then when everything finally gets together, especially gangly dudes, when you finally sink everything, it seems to be like you make that jump where other people don't have that extra level necessarily to get to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, definitely from like a mental standpoint, it kind of keeps you going. You know what I mean? You're like, man, these guys are throwing 90. They're 17 years old. Or these guys are hitting, you know, balls 380 feet. They're juniors in high school. Like, you know, then that kind of pushes you to want to keep getting, you know, like I want to do those things. I want to throw 90. I want to, I want to be a guy that gets known that, oh, he's, he's a high school kid throwing nine years old. So it kind of, it's definitely a good thing from like a mental standpoint of wanting to get better. And then, um, like you said, when that jump happens, um, it's huge. It really is. So you're a, a Juco band and I know you ha- hung with uh, Eric Sim a little bit. I saw some of those AVs. Sim's a great dude. Like I'm, I've been friends with him for a while. Um, what do you tell people about the Juco route? I think it's becoming like, honestly, because he's touting it. Um, I think it's a great, it, it, it's a, it's a great option. And people are realizing that Juco baseball is freaking sick. Um, yeah. what would you tell someone that's considering Juco? And I would just, just trust in it. Like, believe that that's the route you were meant to go. I know a lot of people think like, Oh, you don't go D one. Like you're not going to play pro ball. You're never going to get, you're never going to get past college. If you don't go D one, D two, like go D two, go D three, go Juco. Uh, I mean, just with like, social media nowadays you can find anybody anywhere you know it doesn't it's just about having that opportunity to go play collegiately but specifically to like the juco level it's just a bunch of grinders you know what i mean like we all know we're there because you know we weren't the best baseball player in high school we weren't the best kid in the city we weren't getting scouted by you know fsu or uf as freshmen in high school so like you kind of got that chip on your shoulder when you get to junior college um for me specifically leaving a division one school to go to a JUCO. I was already now in my second year of junior college. So I was really risking a lot. You know, I have a down year. I don't, I don't perform. I might be done playing baseball because now, you know, that JUCO route's right at the end for me, but um, that's kind of something that pushed me. I knew that I was uh, possibly my last year to play baseball. So really had a, really had a buy-in and I had a great group of guys there at Daytona to buy in with. See, I love that. I think it also helps. It probably builds character. I think there, there's some, it's unrealistic sometimes at a D1 baseball program, what the grind is going to be like in the minor leagues. Um, and if you're used to that grind and you embrace the grind, I think it probably helps you in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I mean, you know, playing at Daytona state, we travel, you know, over to Chipola to St. John's, like, you're grind, you know, it's a grind. You're getting on the bus at seven in the morning. You're taking that three hour trip to, you know, the panhandle of Florida to go play doubleheader. And then you're coming back and you got to be ready to go Monday morning, 5 a.m. swim, you know. So it's just like just that grind of knowing, like being able to push each other to, to just we, we, we all wanted to be better. We all wanted to get that that scholarship over and go to a, a four year school after that. So uh, we really were able to push ourselves. So you get some incredible movement from your arm slot too. Like that's one thing. And I think you've added a little bit more movement um, this year, it looks like, but your, uh, your sinker and slider, both that combo is, can be absurd with the amount of horizontal movement you get. Do you ever feel sorry for hitters? Like, I mean, you did, you did poor Herrera. Like you put him on the infinity day IL. <laughs> infinity day. I love that. I was uh... <laughs> The next day I was in the clubhouse and guys are just, they come up, dude, infinity day IL, really? Like just laughing. <laughs> Great. Um, no, I mean, I don't, I don't feel bad for him. You know, those guys are both those, Oduble, he's a, he's a tremendous hitter. Um, 
it was it was a fun at bat. It was I, I executed where I wanted to go with the pitch, you know, in my head. I know he's a, a little bit of a free swinger. So I went aggressively with that back foot slider and ended up, you know, I executed my pitch and got a fun swing out of it. Yeah, that is such a it is such a good pitch. I mean, I saw it as soon as as soon as I saw it break, I was like, man, that's that's trouble. Yeah, it's the uh, the funny thing is, is I, I get through that inning, I come back in the dugout, and uh, one of the pitchers comes up and he goes, "Bro, that's definitely going on pitching ninja." Like that's <laughs> that's gonna be on pitching ninja. I get back inside, my sister like texts our family group. She's like, "That's one hundred percent going on pitching ninja." Blah, blah blah. And then like fifteen minutes later, it popped up on Twitter, and my family just going nuts. It was funny. It kind of had to. Like you didn't give me any choice. That thing is, uh, and you'll be there a lot because like last year, I noticed it too. I'm 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 watching you and your stuff moves cartoon like like it is it's awesome to watch a guy throwing what what have you topped out at like 102 i've seen uh 101 yeah i was like okay. uh, first big league strikeout was uh 101.3 and i as, as what i can recall is the hardest i've thrown see i round up anything that's even over a number yeah. we just go to the next number <laughs> Good with that. yeah yeah absolutely that's a, it's a pitcher's mindset you got to give them a little bit um, but like 101 out of that arm slot, people don't see that very often. What do hitters tell you? Oh, uh, they just tell me it's uncomfortable. They tell me to trust it. You know, I had a little bit of uh, control issues last year. So for them, I was just like, dude, like it, it sucks at your sidearm and then you're throwing 95 plus, like, don't even like, don't try to paint the black. Don't try to just set your catcher up middle, middle and force the hitter to hit it. Like that's, and that's kind of some of the things that helped me out the most is hearing things from hitters from their perspective and their, you know, their point of view is like knowing like they don't want to get in the box when I'm pitching. So that's, that's just like a confidence boost for me. Not only, you know, knowing that my stuff is good, but hearing from hitters that are getting in the box, like, dude, like, I don't want to face you. It's definitely something that uh, that's helped me. So how hard is that? Like making the adjustment and, and, and this is what I think all fans think all players think when you're going up to the major leagues, you're sitting there going, these are the best hitters in the world. It's, it's got to be a little intimidating. And plus, it's almost like you remember like going from third grade to fourth grade or from junior high to high school. They're like, when you get to high school, you're not going to be able to get away with that. It's like, I think we tell pitchers that like you're going to have to be really careful and spot your stuff up because major league hitters can time an airplane or a bullet. How hard is it to break that mindset where you're not trying to be too fine and you're just attacking the zone? Uh, it just it kind of goes hand in hand with what you said about, you know, the closer type reliever, the back end reliever. It's like when you see those guys come in a game, it's my stuff against your stuff. Right. It's like my best pitch against your best swing, you know, versus like maybe a starter mindset is, hey, we got to get through five or six innings. We got to switch up the way we pitch the second time through the order, third time through it or whatever, like kind of being in that that back end reliever mindset of like I trust my stuff more than I trust yours. So it's like, let's, let's go, like, let's go at it. Let's go head to head. And that's why I, I love like just being a reliever and just going with, it's just stuff versus stuff, you know, like the thinking, the thought process of the trying to nitpick all that that's out the window. It's like, let's go. Like it's a battle. Do you like the idea of never knowing when you're going to go into a game too? Because there are, there are starters that I love the routine, like Clayton Kershaw. He has his routine. This is what he does as a reliever. You may or may not pitch every day you may pitch every day um is that's like some people thrive on that they want to be thrown in there they want to compete like you're going you're going to go in balls to the wall for that inning that you're in there and you're competing against the guy because it's an athletic competition it's not darts um is that something that you thrive on yeah absolutely um just like the randomness of it uh the accountability of like making sure that you're ready throughout the game, because as soon as that phone rings and you're, you know, we're not just sitting there watching the game until the seventh inning. It's like, Hey, you're coming in. Like you kind of get a feel for the game where it's at, you'll start moving around or whatever it may be. But um, for me, it's just like knowing that I'm available every day to possibly help the team out in whatever manner that may be. Like that's definitely the spot I was meant to be in. Are you competitive in kind of everything? Is that like your thing or are you more chill? Uh, I'd say I'm pretty chill. Um, definitely there's some things to be competitive in, you know, maybe video games or whatever, but, um, no, I'd say I'm pretty chill outside of, outside the game. What type of mental cues do you give yourself? Like, I think the mental aspect of, of baseball, especially in, in your position where you could be thrown into a high leverage situation, 
is it something that you it just comes natural to you? Are there things that help you reset? Are there mantras you have? Do you study hitters that are coming up in that inning? Or is it just like, I'm going at it and I trust my stuff more than I trust someone else's stuff? A little bit of mixture of both. You know, last year coming up and just like, just that adrenaline of, you know, being a rookie or whatever, just trying to like, I just wanted to go out there and throw everything as hard as I could and all that stuff. And this year for me, kind of switched it up a little bit. Like, hey, let's, it's year two. Let's let's kind of try to settle ourselves in the big leagues. Let's make a name for ourselves. And uh, big cue for me is like trying to be just look like as relaxed as possible, like as long as I possibly can, and then like and then go. So I mean, if you look at uh, I don't know some of my videos I made. I don't know if it, if it comes across like lackadaisical or like lazy, but like I just try to be real chill with my mechanics until the end, and then just fire off at the end. Um, just it's repeatable for me it's a it's a good cue that i'm able to repeat and kind of keeps me within myself that makes sense though too because you don't want to start too quick and tense up too quick and let your you want your body to sequence right so if your your cue is just chill and then explode i guess or something like that yeah no yeah definitely just like as relaxed as possible for as long as i can until it's time to go do you have to remind yourself of that ever? Do you ever tense? Like, I got to think there are times where you get out of that uh, mentality, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say for sure, if I get runners on, I definitely speed up my mechanics a little bit. Um, uh, advantage leverage counts. You know, I might try to get real, you know, like, oh, I'm throwing a, I'm throwing a heater here, an O2 count, you know, and then we'll get a little bit, a uh, little out of tune with the mechanics. But you know, part of the learning is dialing it back in, you know, making that one pitch adjustment. Is, are you, so you're intentionally dialing back a tiny bit this year with, uh, with stuff to make sure you're in the zone and to make sure your stuff plays. Are you uh, like, what are you doing c command wise? Um, like you said, I mean, these guys are the best hitters in the world. So like for me, I had to look at it from a, an execution standpoint, um, you know, throwing two balls at a hundred to the best hitters in the world. Now they're two owner hitters count or, you know, getting the count Oh two at 94, 95. And then kind of, we can go up from there, you know, or we can, you know, we can work off of an Oh two count much better than we can work off of an, a two Oh count. So kind of, I guess a, a maturity thing for me this year is understanding the game, understanding hitters, understanding, you know, the advantages they have at a two Oh count versus an Oh two count or one, two count. And I got to think 95 in the zone plays pretty well for you too, because of the move, you know, just elite movement you get, and you get a lot of ground balls as well, which probably plays well at Coors Field. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing too, is with, with the movement this year, um, there's some more horizontal on both pitches actually this year. So I would much rather, you know, dial it back to 94, 95, get that movement in the zone, you know, versus yanking a hundred across the zone or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, at Coors, it, um, it's definitely a place you want to keep the ball down. It's a place where you want to get ground balls. And, um, like you said, the, the results have been there with that and just being, a being a guy that can come out of the pen and, and get ground balls there, especially if you get called in with runners on or whatever, that's, uh, it's important to do. How hard is that? Because obviously pitching in Coors is an acquired taste, but your ground ball rate is, is really good. How long did it take you to realize like, Hey, this is a great thing and for the team to realize it like hey we want a guy that's going to throw ground balls justin's the man for it and uh and his stuff is just flat out nasty i mean i know that at first you're probably coming in wanting to blow people away because that's the mentality but a ground ball is an out too yeah no absolutely um just kind of understanding what the pitch does differently at course you know you like people see it as a disadvantage oh your stuff doesn't break as much or whatever but I mean, the reality is we play half of our games there, so we have an advantage. We throw far more games there then, so we're going to understand, you know, for me, being a sinker slider guy, it's just going to be a little less horizontal. So it's just going to be a matter of changing my starting point. You know, it's not, hey, I'm trying to throw a sinker and it's cutting, or I'm trying to throw a slider and it's turning into a curveball. Like, I'm just losing a little bit of horizontal on those. So um, for me, it's just changing the starting point a little bit. I mean, I think that's a great mentality to have because you're just out competing the opposing pitcher. Like if you can, if you guys can execute better at your home field in the environment that you know, and you know it better than anybody, 
you guys should have an advantage, right? Because everybody's got to pitch on the same mound in the same, you know, with the, with the same air. And uh, you just have to do it better than the other guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like I said, you know, we have a team come in. They're only here for a four-game set once a year. Like, they're not going to have that time to – they're not going to figure it out in one throwing program before the, you know, before the series starts or whatever. Like I said, we play half our games there. So, knowing, like, hey, my stuff's going to break a little less. Let's start – a little bit less, you know, off the plate or whatever that may be. Uh, opposing pitchers, aren't, I don't think they'll have that time to figure that out. So they say it's a disadvantage to pitch here. But, I mean, from my standpoint, I, I see it as an advantage for sure. Are there any hitters that have amazed you? Like you've gotten to face them and you're like, wow, this is real now. Like I'm in the big leagues because this is a guy I watched growing up. Were you a big baseball fan growing up? And is, you know, are, are there any moments that were like, I kind of made it now. This is sick. Uh, yeah, definitely. The first one that comes to mind is uh, Freddie Freeman. So my mom, she was born in Panama. When she was younger, the only American channel she got was TBS. And she loved baseball. So like TBS, she had to watch the Braves. So then just growing up, I every night, me and my mom were watching the Braves. So I saw him from high school on up, like watching Freddie Freeman and all that stuff. And then um, seeing him on opening day in a Dodgers uniform and I had my mom in the stands. I was like, dude, this is, this is, it's weird because I was used to watching him, you know, in a Braves uniform, but then like now I'm on the mound and I'm facing him. I was like, this is like all, everything just kind of comes together at once. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that's the, and he's such a good hitter. Like that dude has yeah. relatively no weak spots. What do you do like to, uh, to grab, how would you attack somebody like that? Just your best stuff. Right. Yeah, especially, I mean, a, a, a hitter as great as Freddie Freeman, you know, you, you listen in on the scouting reports and you almost, you almost want to like block it out. You know, some of the scouting reports you hear of some of these great hitters, you're like, well, I mean, <laughs> it's like, oh, he, he's great on the off speed. No, don't throw your heater in, but make sure you run it off the plate. And like, da, 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 you kind of get all, I'm like, you know what? And I'm just like, this guy's, this guy's a hall of famer. Like, I'm just going to go at him. You know what I mean? Like, and then let's go for it. Let's see what happens. He's, he's one of the greatest hitters to, to play the game. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out of one of my best stuff. How much do you rely on things like heat maps? Or is it just, are you reading swings? Are you looking at heat maps, a combination, um, or relying on, on catcher to, uh, to call a game? And you're just going to throw what he puts down? Um, I, I definitely have trust in my catchers. But at times, I'll throw a pitch. And I'm kind of more in the moment, not necessarily, you know, the the looking at the scouting report or the heat maps or anything, I kind of go based off of what I'm seeing, like in that bat, in that moment, because, um, you know, like some of the scouting reports are going to be off your standard stock, right-handed pitcher or whatever it may be. So, you know, coming from a different angle and stuff like that, I try not to get too, too tied up in it. But like I said, that's fine with me because I like to go with that. Like here it is, hit it if you can mentality. Is there anybody that you watch pitching wise that you're saying his approach is somewhat similar to mine and I can pick up something from them? I may add this pitch because this guy does this. Or do you think your stuff is is that unique that there really isn't anybody that you can gather stuff from? Uh, one that I really like looking at is um, Miguel Castro. He's a good call. I would say he's a touch higher than me, but like stuff wise, um, I think I'd say we're pretty similar. So I like to look at a. Uh, I like watching his approach and kind of how he goes about guys. One of the very first guys that, I mean, I've probably seen uh, every YouTube videos, uh, Michael Gibbons and Steve Ciszek. When I first dropped down, like those were like the two guys that I really like tried to emulate my stuff around. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, probably now is, is Miguel Castro. Just seeing we're very similar, you know, velo wise and stuff wise. That's a good call. Cause he actually had like uh, my sword of the year last year. And uh, also a Bohemian Rhapsody thing. So you guys yeah. are somewhat still, you have that in common, which is awesome. I love it. That's super. Let's go through some pitch grips. Um, Cause I am curious how you get so much horizontal stuff. And do you use like things like, are you, are you looking at the analytics behind your pitches when you're developing them and, and just really focusing on that movement and how different grips change it, looking at edutronic videos, stuff like that. Yeah, definitely this offseason uh, was a big one for me where I was training at. You know, they had the Edratronic, they had the track man, And we started kind of looking at um, looking at my slider grip. My first couple bullpens, I was throwing the slider I was throwing last year. 
and a guy there I was working with was like, Hey, look, like, let's try this. And he really broke it down. Like, like scientifically, like why he thinks that this is going to be a better pitch, you know, analytically or whatever. Um, and that's, that's the slider I've been throwing this year and just, just command wise, I feel like I can throw it in any count. So, uh, yeah, I definitely got to give it up to, you know, having that track man and that technology to having the tangible evidence, like right after a pitch, right. You know, when you're little, you're like, Hey dude, tell me which one moves move. more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nasty or is this one nasty? Now you have like the numbers that say, actually, this one's the better pitch. So were you throwing it more gyro -y? like your slider more gyro spin wise, and now it's more of a sweeping type thing. Is that what you're trying to do? Uh, not necessarily. The gyro is going to be like super, like that rifle low spin. Right. I try to, here's my little fake. Yeah, make yeah let's, let's do this. Like if I'm, you think of my slot, like I'm sidearm <laughs> slot. Yep. So I'm like, and I just keep it like this. And I just try to spin it out front. Like I try to absolutely spin it as much as I can. So, so you're getting like, like a UFO spin, like a flying spin. Yeah, spin. Getting more side spin. Um, last year you can kind of see I was a I was a touch higher with my uh, my slider grip, and that was kind of one of the things that we talked about um, with the coaches was like, hey, like your fastball, you're right out to the side, you kind of creep up on your slider. So that was big for me this off season. Was like I want to find something, so a slider grip that I can throw from the same slot without trying to having to manipulate my arm slot to create the shape. And um, yeah, like I said, that grip that I'm working with is like, I can throw it as hard as I can and just think about really spinning it out front. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And were, did hitters tell you that you might be, like they could pick up your slider before because it was a different arm slot? Or is that, is that something that, that somebody told you in the analytics department or film, to, film room, what, what, what was it? Yeah, it was just a little mixture of both that uh, some of the analytics department and uh, Buddy told me like, hey, you know, we're creeping up on the slider. Hitters may pick up on it, especially if they're, you know, if they're sitting on it. And, you know, if I guess if a hitter sees it that early enough of the, a raised arm slot, they may have time to react to it. Um, biggest thing for me was, you know, the coaching staff suggested it. And, you know, sometimes you just, yes, sir, let's do it. And and get it done yeah especially when it works like so is it a four seam grip like how are you gripping it so i'm right on the uh on the horseshoe okay so if like you had the two seams like this mm -hmm. my fastball I'm right there i'm just right over off the horseshoe on that side right just right where the finger curves on that horseshoe right there and then i get the two flat surfaces of the ball on the top and the bottom is that's where i think it kind of goes and then kind of air the gravity the air just just takes it Nice. And your sinker is kind of, so it's the opposite of that? I'm just right on the two seams. So I'm right right in the middle of the two seams are there, just there. And I think it's kind of similar thought process, kind of having that flat part of the ball on top, kind of let it run and then let that air kind of take over. And that's just something like I was, I never understood before. Like when you speak of, you know, technology and analytics and all that stuff, it was, uh, it was always just like grip it and rip it. And then whatever grip felt good kind of throwing it but now it's like hey let's let's hold it like this because you know seam shifted wake or whatever is going to make the ball it's going to make the ball take off and like you said just having a more uh consistent release point i'm able to get more horizontal this year on both of my pitches so it's uh it's working out so it's kind of like the mix and i love this this is actually a great point you're a mix between out competing somebody but using analytics to fine tune what you do and using video and using kind of advanced technologies to make it better which is something that in the past pitchers may not have been able to do like if, if you're talking about guys in the 80s it would be like hey did this move a lot how did this work so the process is much longer for them where you can figure it out pretty quickly by looking at your numbers by looking at the edutronic by saying you know or, or somebody telling you hey you might want to do this because the air will take the ball and make it move. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like for me, I threw my first bullpen and a uh, pitching guy we had there, he's like my secret weapon. I can't, can't, can't take him out of play. Um, but no, he was like, hey, how are you throwing that? You know, I saw my slider grip. He's like, try this. I want to see this. And I threw one. And luckily enough, I was working out a place where Dom Nunez, our catcher was. So he was catching my bullpen and he, he's like, yeah, whatever that was, like, keep throwing that. Like, it was one – he showed me it through one pitch, and it was like, dude, that's it. 
and then just kind of kept working with it from that bullpen on. And um, initially early on, like I was yanking it really hard because of how much like horizontal I was getting on it. And it was just a completely different release. But once I was able to find the release, like the consistency of it is just day and night from last year, not only being able to throw it more consistently, but just like analytically, it's just a better pitch all around. That's it. So when you're growing up, was there any pitcher? I mean, you mentioned Freddie watching him. What about pitcher wise? Was there somebody that it doesn't have to be the same arm slot? It could be. It doesn't have to be um, somebody that you took stuff from or you just looked up to. You said, this guy's awesome. I'd love to be like that. Yeah, uh, easily 100 percent Mariano Rivera, um, you know, best closer of all time. But he's also Panamanian. I'm Panamanian. So for me, like wanting to kind of maybe grow into a closer role or back end role, like I just think it'd be really, really cool. You know, it'd be another Panamanian closer in the MLB after, you know, growing up and watching the greatest closer of all time do it. Was so have you met him? No, my uh, it's actually. My dad, when he was younger, like he played against Mariana Bear. Like they didn't really, they didn't know each other, but like they played against each other. And uh, we went to a spring training game when I was way, way younger. And we saw Mariana Bear walking. And my dad's like, hey, whoa, whoa. And like hollers at him. And like Mariana looks up. He's like, like kind of had that glimpse of like, wait a second. I like, I know you from way back when. So that was kind of cool. But I've never, I'd love to meet him in person. That'd be absolutely surreal. Yeah. It, it, the other thing about him is the way he, he just carries himself. Like he carries himself with, with class. Like he's one of those guys that you look at him. It's why, I mean, a unanimous hall of famer. And it wasn't just because he was the best closer. He was also just a good dude, unflappable. Um, always, you, you mentioned being calm, having that calm. He always seemed to me that, to have that calm about him, which is why he was perfect for that role. You could have either a psychopath or you can have a guy that's just, chill and does his job every time yeah uh, absolutely um I guess for him like you said just being calm like as a hitter you're like hey you know this cutter's coming like he's he's going to throw you the cutter like it's coming be ready for it and like still not able to get anything done with it um yeah like you said for some guys it's calm some guys it's Liam Hendricks you know like it's for me I'm like I gotta find I got to find between those two spectrums, like, or that spectrum, like which one works for me? Yeah. So for, for, for my stuff, it's a psycho that looks good on video, but I also have a lot of like the guy that like looking at Mariano pitch, and this is a great mentality. Like I think it should help every pitcher. He knew his stuff better than the hitter knew his stuff. He, he threw one main pitch and could get you out with it, even though hitters knew it was coming. And that tells you that hitters maybe aren't that, great as we say they are like we give them maybe too much respect sometimes and if your best stuff is better than theirs keep at it you don't have to constantly trick people yeah yeah exactly we uh we have alex column in our bullpen and he's he's very similar he's four seam cutter and and that's it he's like catcher puts down one sign and he chooses if he's going to cut it or if he's not going to cut it and he's one of the chillest guys in our bullpen like you see him go out on the mound and he's just just real chill, real lax. Like you can tell nothing. I mean, you see, he's led the league and saves it one year. And like, you could tell, like, he's one of those guys that probably leans towards that, that Mariano Rivera type calmness, you know? And, and you have Bard who's been through a whole heck of a lot. Like uh, what do you, do you ever, uh, have you learned anything from watching those guys? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been able to nitpick every single one of those guys in the bullpens, you know, it's, as far as you go to a guy like Chassin or like you said, a guy like Bard, like Bard's a guy that we throw similar. He's a touch higher, but stuff wise, uh, we throw very similar. And then just from like a mental standpoint, you know, he's overcame it all. So you can, you can, I can, I'm able to go to him about anything. You know, you got guys like TK. I mean, he's such a leader in that bullpen. Like he's a guy that I can confide in to talk about like anything. So it's like, I could honestly choose, you know, one thing about every guy in those bullpens and then talk about them all day. Yeah. That that's, that's the great part about a bullpen. Do you have any good funny story? Like being a bullpen and a, a Juco guy, you've got to like, that's kind of the ultimate you crazy folks around you. Um, are there any good stories that you, that you can share that are, you know, PG 13. Um, that I could share probably not that I could share <laughs> off the top of, and I, 
I can't really, uh, I can't really think of any. I don't want to put you on the spot because it could be like we get going and you start telling a story and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, that can't probably should be. Going yeah, to. junior college, that's that's fun. So yeah, junior college, different different animal. Oh, absolutely. So recovery wise, like being a being a reliever, you know, you have to recover after every start. Are you a ice guy? Do you use a Mark Pro? Do you use, do you lift? What do you do to recover and make sure that you're good to go? next out again have you always been quick at recovery yeah i've been pretty uh i've usually been pretty good about recovery uh, i don't get terribly sore i just like I, I like to be available every day even if i'm sore like i'm gonna be like hey coach just letting you know i'm a little sore today like because i know i can throw through soreness like soreness is fine you know it's pain that you don't want to throw through um like i said i want to be available as many games as possible but um for me like I'll maybe contrast, you know, like hot tub, cold tub. Um, if, if need be, we have a massage therapist that does a really, really good job of like, you'd be like, Hey, like I'm a little bit sore right here. And he'll like wiggle your left big toe. And then it stops being sore up here. Like it's, he's like a magician. That stuff's always weird to me. Like how everything is interconnected because it actually yeah. does work and you never think yeah. about it. You're like, like, I want to rub this. Like why am I sore here? Oh, it's because your left trap is tight. Like let's loosen this up. And then that stops being sore. It's crazy. Absolutely. Like, uh, but I love that attitude too, because you do want to be available at all times because you don't even know, like there's sometimes where you're sore and that may be your best outing. Like, you, you know, it doesn't mean that just be, Learning to pitch when you're not at a hundred percent is something that's really tough mentally for some guys. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you gotta, you're not as a reliever, you're not, you don't have that five day routine to like, make sure like leading up to like, all right, I'm going to feel great today because I did everything I needed to do the last four days. You know, some days you might not sleep good. Some days you might wake up with a crick in your neck, but like, you just got to be ready to go that day and, and be able to throw through it. And, you know, you see the guys that they throw 70 games a year. Like they're known as like one of the more reliable guys in the game. Like that's what you kind of want to build up towards as a reliever. Well, I mean, Tyler Rogers has that kind of weird arm slot too. And he's, he pitches like every day or something. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, it's really impressive. And it's just about, you know, being able to find a routine that you can kind of bounce back and know that you'll be ready to go the next day. Plus it's, it's great for your teammates. Like you want it. I mean, you want the team to be able to rely on you and you want to be part of the game. Like the more, you know, as a reliever, you have a limited time where you're in. So the more times you can appear, the better you're going to help the team. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's a big, you know, it says a lot to the, to your teammates when, Hey, you've thrown three out of four days, or you've thrown four out of five days, but like, you're grinding out there. You're going out there. You're getting the job done. You're giving the chance to te uh, the team a win. You're leaving the score where it was or whatever it may, it may be. But like, especially like the position players, like they see you coming in four out of five days or whatever it may be. They're like, dude, this guy's grinding for us. Yeah. I love that. It's setting an example for them. And, and I think it fires everybody up knowing that that's the, that's the case. What's the next step for you? Like, what do you think what can you do better? And where do you think your, what's your ultimate goal? Or do you even set goals for yourself? Is your goal just to be as good as you can each day and let the results take care of themselves? Um, yeah, definitely a little bit of both for me. It's, it's trying not to look too far ahead. You know, a lot of the times it's like, you're always looking for what's next or whatever. Like, oh gosh, I probably catch myself five times a day. I'm like, dude, you're in the big leagues. Like this is like, you're, you are what you've been, wanting since you were like a five-year-old kid like you're literally living smack dab in the middle of it but then at the same time too it's like okay we're here but now let's let's stay let's see what we got to do to stay here as long as possible and you know for me it's like I just want to be the best teammate I can be like I want I want like I said I want those guys to rely on me whether it's we're down nine up nine I come in and tie game bases loaded like I want to be like a reliable teammate for as long as possible and whatever that evolves into if it's a setup guy a ninth inning guy like that, that's just what you know that's what the plan happens to be but for me right now it's like I, I got to be the best teammate I can be do you ever take that attitude with you I love that where you're just like waking up and this is where I wanted to be when fans are asking like kids come up to you and say hey can I have your autograph um is that still a little surreal and are you happy about that like is that a a, a cool thing or does it ever get old no it's definitely not doesn't get old for me uh 
I remember being that kid. I remember going to the, you know, Jacksonville Suns game and wanted to be that kid that was up trying to get as many balls in a game or going and getting autographs. And like, so like for me in the moment, it's like, I, I know what they're feeling. Like I remember that feeling very clearly. So like I take the time, you know, to sign the balls. I take the time to sign the stuff or take pictures or whatever it may be because I was that kid once, you know, and I don't want that kid to grow up and I don't know, maybe you never know one day, like kid may not like the game anymore because he saw how the big leaguers reacted to wanting his autograph or whatever. So like, I don't want to ever be known as that guy. And what is the big thing that you love about baseball? Like what, why baseball? Why is that the thing that you have, you know, grown a career around? Um, just something that it was the sport that, that I stuck to growing up, you know, I tried out all the sports and all that stuff, but baseball is the one that I really liked and, you know, just being able to, to call it a job, you know, an everyday job is, is kind of the, the thing that keeps me going, you know, like I, if I can do this until I'm 40, I'll do it till I'm 40. It's just, I, I really enjoy it every day. Like it's just this, you know, the, the routine of it, like, I love it. Like I, I would do it as long as I can. It's funny because I, I kind of think the same way about like, this is a job to me, like talking to people, players and tweeting about baseball and stuff. Like it's surreal, like that, you know, all this stuff. And I don't, I think if you never lose touch with it, it, it just helps. It keeps you grounded. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like me and my, my roommate, we have, you know, this inside joke where like, if we're in the locker room or something, he's like, dude, I'm tired today. Like, I'm just not feeling it. Like, I don't want to go lift. I'm like, bro, we're in the big leagues, man. Like it doesn't, it don't get much better than this. Like figure you know, like knock that tiredness out or something because it could be, it could be a lot worse. I love that attitude. That's great. And I hope you never lose it. Like, I think some people get jaded and, uh, you know, they start feeling themselves a little much. And I think keeping that attitude that, you know, it also can be taken away from you any day and you might as well enjoy it while you're there and be the best you, you can be out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, that's my big thing for me, like not just on the field, but off the field, uh, you know, like I want to be a, a great teammate, but like, I want to be a better person off the field. You know, it's, I want to be that well, you know, well-rounded, just all around good person. That's kind of a big thing that I strive for is just on and off the field, just trying to be a great person, great teammate, great husband, just all those things. I, I want to be relied on more than just on the field. I love it. Well, I will let you go. Cause I, I mean, I know you're busy and uh, you know, we may be back in touch somewhere down the, somewhere down the road as you kill other hitters. Um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this becomes a regular thing. Like, I love watching you pitch. You're unique. You have dynamic stuff. And, you know, I look forward to you just destroying guys day in and day out. And uh, thank you for coming on. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. I just want to give a quick shout out to Rip City and my buddy uh, Beckham Brown back in Jacksonville. He's I think he's nine years old. He's a baseball player on the spectrum and he is the coolest kid I've ever met in my life. And that kid grinds. He grinds like no other man. He's a He's a special kid. I love it. Is he a pitcher or a hitter? He's a hitter. He just uh, he just turned into a catcher, and dude, he's his vision back there is it's uh, it's something I've never seen before. That is awesome to hear. Well, that's a that's a great shout out. And a hey, he made pitching ninja. Look, look at that. He's not even oh. a pitcher, and he made it. That's great. Yeah. Well, dude, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it.